participants who await their master's return from a wedding, ready to open immediately when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those servants whom the master finds vigilant on his arrival. Amen, I say to you, he will gird himself, have the servants recline at table, and proceed to wait on them. And should he come in the second or third watch and find them prepared in this way, blessed are those servants. Be sure of this, if the master of the house had known the hour when the thief was coming, he would have not let his house be broken into. You must also be prepared for at any hour you do not expect the Son of Man will come. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Good morning. Good morning. morning. There was a uh, story told about a man who started a business and was not successful. And so he was really experiencing the pains of failure, did not know what to do. So he approached his priest and said, Father, you have to help me with this. I'm just totally losing faith. I started a business, it's failing, I'm not making enough money, my family is suffering, I'm really down and out, and I just don't know where to turn. And the priest said, well, you need to rediscover your faith. What I want you to do is to take a beach chair and go down to the ocean and place that beach chair right at the water's edge and then sit down in the beach chair. Open up your Bible and lay it in your lap. Let the wind rifle through the pages of the Bible. And when the wind stops, look down, and the first words you see will be your answer. Have faith. About a year later, the man comes back, uh, holds up in a nice brand new car, wearing a tailor-made designer suit, nice Rolex, as a check for the priest and says, Father, you gave me the best advice in the world. I want to make this large donation to the church. And the priest said, so you did what I told you to do, as I did everything exactly the way you told me to do it. He said, so you actually took the beach chair and put it at the water's edge. Yep, I did that. And you sat down and put your Bible in your lap. Yep, I did that too. And you let the wind rifle through the pages. Yes, Father, I did that too. And when the wind stopped, you looked down, and what were the first words you saw? looked up and he said, chapter 11. <laughs> now, as silly as that story may be, okay, as silly as that may be, it actually has a lot more to do with faith than some of the Baltimore catechism that we were raised with. Because we were raised with this idea that faith is about doctrine and dogma and a belief system and all these concepts that live up in our head. And yet, through all of that knowledge and understanding of what our faith means, we kind of forgot about the experiential part, which is really what faith is. It's not just a body of dogma. I mean, we do have our beliefs. It's not just a body of pronouncements and doctrine although we have that too. But that's not what's going to sustain us going through life. What sustains us is the kind of relationship that faith calls us to. That first reading from the Book of Wisdom and all the Old Testament is revolutionary in its time. Today when we look back and we say the word one God or monotheism, we're really used to that. It's no big deal. <coughs> But at the time of the Hebrew nation, at the time that those readings are talking about the experience of Israel with God, it is all different. That is a revolutionary concept because the Egyptians had many gods, and the Romans had many gods, and the Greeks had many gods. This whole idea of one God was brand new in history. 
And the genius of that is that it calls us into relationship. It's a one-on-one -on -one type of a feeling. It's a one-on-one -on -one experience. First time in civilization, we have a breakthrough of consciousness, a breakthrough of God's reality as a person, not just a statue somewhere in a Greek temple, but a person that we can relate to, a person that is part of the Passover, a person that glorifies his people. I think that line in the middle of the wisdom reading is really uh, unique because God is glorifying his people. What is, I thought we're supposed to be glorifying God. How does God glorify his people? He glorifies his people by reflecting his goodness in them. See how experiential that is? It's the you and I experience. It's much more intimate, much more connective than a body of beliefs or a, 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 a book of rules and, and doctrines, as good as and important as they are. That experience is so important. Psychologists talk, uh, and you may have heard this term, the constituting other. Okay? The constituting other is that person in our lives that constitutes us, that gives us our identity, that reflects the goodness that we have. It's the mother okay, that nourished us from day one and protected us and allowed us to have the feeling that the universe was a safe place. That was a constituting other. Monotheism is God being a constituting other in our lives. That type of relationship. And that's why we find the movement in our lives to have special friends. Many of us call to marriage. Okay, so that we can have that constituting other in our lives. Someone that reflects to us the goodness that we are. I'm sure you have heard the phrase or maybe used it yourself. I just don't feel as much of myself as I am feeling when I'm with you. You make me feel like the real me. Okay, that's what brings people together. That's the constituting other. And that's what monotheism gives us. One God, one person that has that spot, that true north, okay, that guiding force, that, that consistent, that person that says you will always be forgiven, you will always be loved, I am that person here and present for you and with you. Now in today's society, I think that's a pretty difficult uh, experience to keep in mind because when we talk about the constituting other and we turn the TV on and we see there's a new sports figure and there's a new actress and there's a new actor and there's a new concept and there's a new clothesline and there's advertisements about constituting what we should be. Okay, and the young people today have four, five, six, seven hundred friends on their Facebook page, right? All these constituting others, it's become a hall of mirrors. And we have lost the sight of the one mirror, the constituting other in our lives, and we have all this variety. We're on a merry-go-round of a, a revolving hall of mirrors. And I feel sorry sometimes for our young people because they're searching for that constituting other. They're searching for that one secure, dependable, constant reminder of how good they are. And yet we see hundreds of examples on TV, on billboards, on the radio of what we need to do to be acceptable, to be pretty, okay, to be strong, to be manly, to be womanly. All these other concepts are out there trying to pull us in and to become something that God is giving us right off the bat. And what does Luke say in that gospel reading? Be vigilant. Gird your loins. Light your lamps. Turn the lights on. Be aware of who you let in your life as a constituting other. Be aware of that. Because you can be sidetracked when somebody maybe gives you a concept or a thought or a friendship or, you know, let's join this gang, let's do this drug. Okay? Why is, you know, why do we tell our young people you know, don't go to clubs and have one-night stands and multiple relationships. All those constituting others are bound to confuse you. They're bound to confuse you unless you know who you really are first. 
and who we really are first. It's not part of a gang, not part of a, a group of people that want us to do what they want to do and lead us in multiple directions, but our identity of who I am is to be a son, a daughter, connected to my God. So Jesus says, be vigilant. Keep the lights on. Be discriminating. And do so as a servant waits for his master. Do so with the feeling of being a servant. Okay? And we've all had servants, right? There's three kinds. You had the servant that's overbearing, right? Can't let you eat your meal. Are you done yet? Can I take this? Are you done that? Get away and leave me alone. I'm trying to talk to this person. Or you've had the waiter, the servant, you can never find them. Right? Where are they? Okay, they stop by once in a you know hour and a half meal. And then there's the servant that Jesus is talking about who's vigilant. It's not about his ego. It's not about doing my thing, taking care of my goals, uh, fulfilling my expectations. But what Jesus is saying is the vigilance that we're called to is the vigilance of servitude, which means my ego goes in the corner so that I can pay attention to your needs. We're all servants or waiters. Diaconate, right? The Greek word diakonia in Greek means, <clears throat> means waiter, right? It technically means a table waiter. That's exactly what servant means in, in, in scripture, a waiter. You're a waiter. Our deacon is a waiter. Okay, we're all called to be waiters. I'm a waiter. I'm just a waiter. I'm a servant. Maybe a head waiter, but I'm, I'm here to serve, to try to put my agenda aside and my goals and my ego aside so that I can be vigilant and watchful and try to promote your journey, my journey, our journey as a people of faith. So today I'm not going to invite you to take a beach chair down to the ocean, okay? But what I am going to invite you to do is to bring your focus and your attention to our Eucharistic table so that you can refresh and renew in your own hearts, in your own mind, your relationship in faith with our God. Let your beings be attentive. Be at peace. Focus on the words that we're going to hear in the Eucharistic prayer and let His Spirit rifle through your being so that you may indeed be refreshed and be willing to be those vigilant, serving experiences of God in this world.